Welcome back to part 2 of the exploit development series. This time we will use a different technique to gain code execution on another command in the Wuln server application. Starting here, we already know that this is the prefix which we must set to gmon in order to trigger the desired execution flow in a Wuln server. Moving to the next node, we see a few move instructions, though the offsets used are not familiar to us, so we will skip this node for now and move on. Right here we have another loop which is almost identical to the one we encountered in the last video, this time checking for a slash instead of a dot when moving through the buffer. Assuming our buffer does contain a slash, we follow the red path at the jump node 0 instruction. In the next node it appears as if the wound server application is calculating the string length of our buffer and then comparing it to hex f6e. If the size of our buffer is below that value, we take the green path, jumping to a node that doesn't look that interesting to us for now. Going back, we assume that our buffer is larger than hex f6e and take the red path. In this node, we see a call to function 3, which might be interesting for us, so we'll investigate it further by double clicking it. In the node of function 3, we can see a call to string copy, which, as we know, might be vulnerable to a buffer overflow. Going back to the previous basic blocks, we can take a note that because of the string length comparison, our buffer has to be larger than hex f6e in order to reach the call to function 3 and by that the call to string copy. Since the next node is basically the end of the gmon command and not that interesting, we'll move on to dynamic analysis for now and start exploiting the application. In our Python script, we start with creating the buffer we want to send to the binary. I already set the prefix to gmon so that the code path previously analyzed in IDA is taken by one server. To pass the first check that takes place inside the loop, we simply add a slash to our buffer and afterwards we can create our pattern string which we will append to it. Remember that our buffer has to be larger than hex f6e bytes in order to pass the second check as well and reach the string copy function. After executing the script and going back to Windybug, we see that EIP was not overwritten by our buffer and we triggered a first chance exception instead. Now if we continue the execution with G, we see that EIP suddenly got overwritten by the buffer and we gain control over it. This happened because we didn't exploit a direct return overwrite but overwrote the SEH chain instead. We can take a look at that chain using the command xchain, which shows that it was indeed overwritten by two values of the previously generated pattern string. Just like in the previous part, we can take those two values and use them to calculate the exact offset for the overwrite of the SEH chain. The structured exception handler topic would be way too large for this one video, though you can check out my article on guided hacking for more information about it. Basically, we've got a linked list of handlers that kicks in if an exception is thrown during runtime and iterated through until one handler can catch and handle the exception thrown. One important thing to note is that an SEH overwrite is only possible in 32-bit applications, as the chain is not stored on the stack in 64-bit ones. If we are able to overwrite the SAH chain and trigger an exception, there are various techniques to gain code execution, for example the PPR one which we are going to utilize in this video. For now, we'll take the smaller offset and adjust our buffer. As I already mentioned, overriding the SEH chain alone might not be enough to trigger an exception and by that gain control over the instruction pointer. So we append some bytes to our buffer to make sure we trigger one. After executing our new script, we can see that once again we triggered the first chance exception. Continuing from here, we can see that we successfully overwrote the SAH chain with our hex 4.3s and hex 4.2s. 
Next, we have to look for a PPR instruction sequence, which stands for pop pop return. This sequence will remove two addresses from the stack and then return to the third one. This third address would be the address of our hex for threes, which we are going to replace with two bytes of jump code and two knobs to keep the stack four byte aligned. That jump code will then jump six bytes, jumping over the two knobs and the four bytes of the PPR address to move the execution flow to the shellcode, which we will place after that address. To find such a pop pop return instruction sequence, we are going to use the tool RP++, which can extract so called gadgets from binaries and DLLs. Simply provide the name of the library you want to scan, which in this case would be the sfunk library, and the maximum number of instructions each gadget may have. In Visual Studio Code, we are using regex inside the search function to look for such PPR sequences. Right here we got a pop ex pop ex return instruction sequence, which would work perfectly in our case. Simply copy the address and replace the value of the seh variable in the Python script with it and the next seh variable with our jump code. If we want to jump just a few bytes, we can use the hex eb opcode and then provide the amount of bytes we want to jump, which in this case would be 6. After that, we just append two knobs for the stack alignment. We execute the script again and move to WinDebug, where we can set a breakpoint at the address of the PPR instruction sequence and continue the execution. Single stepping through the instructions will lead us to our jump code that will move the execution flow to our hex for one buffer. Taking a look at the disassembly shows that the buffer gets truncated up to just a few bytes. In fact, we only have 41 bytes available, which isn't sufficient for any useful shellcode. But 41 bytes are way more than just 4 bytes, so we can place some larger jump code here and move the execution back to the very beginning of our buffer, where we got plenty of space available. We first have to find the offset that we add to the current stack pointer in order to reach the beginning of our buffer again. This can be done using the display command and adding different values to the stack pointer until we find the start of our buffer. Right here we got the beginning of the buffer that we sent to the wound server application and now to calculate the offset we simply subtract ESP from the address we just found. This shows that we have to add around 1500 bytes to the current stack pointer in order to move the execution back to the beginning. Of course the beginning of the current buffer is of not much use to us but we can replace it with some actual shellcode to gain remote code execution eventually. Back in our Linux machine, we can use the MS of NASM shell to convert the assembly instructions that we are going to use for our jump code to the CPU opcodes that we will add to our exploit script. When converting the assembly instruction at ESP1500, which is the offset we calculated in WinDebug earlier, we see that we got some null bytes in the CPU opcodes, so we can't use that instruction right here since the null byte is a bad character. Instead of using the whole 32-bit register ESP, we could just use SP, which is the 16-bit register, to get rid of those null bytes. Finally, after modifying our stack pointer, all we must do is jump to it. Now we can place the jump code after the SEH overwrite to move the execution flow back to the start of the buffer. The only thing we got left to do is generate some shellcode, prepend it to our current buffer and adjust the buffer's length. Since our shellcode is once again encoded and our jump code won't jump to the exact beginning of our buffer, we will simply add a bunch of knobs in front of the shellcode. Finally, we can move to the Windows machine and start the Windserver application outside a debugger.
When moving back to the Linux machine and executing the final version of the proof of concept, we see that our calculator just popped and we once again achieved remote code execution on our victim host. That's it for this video and I hope to catch you again in the next video where we will learn a more advanced technique to overcome space limitations.